Shabbat Shalom, and welcome. Before we start, I want to say a couple of words about Basora Institute, something that's near and dear to Ron and Esther and I, but got some pamphlets here in case you're interested. It's a center for Judeo, Judaic Christian studies. They offer courses, sponsor seminars, sponsor conferences, and you can go on their website and find stuff. And you can find some courses that, um, well, I got to teach two of them. And um, they've had speakers from Israel and from all over the country. There's a couple of seminars coming up at no cost that you can log on to. Everything is online. Somebody once asked, where is their campus? I said, well, it's in Twinsburg, but it's somebody's house. The campus is actually online. <laughs> so I got some pamphlets here if you want to check it out. There's going to be a great speaker um, from Chosen People Ministries coming up, I think, what, in a couple of weeks? When is it? The 9th? Yeah, and it's nice because there's no cost to that one and you can watch it from the comfort of your house and don't have to drive anywhere. But anyway, so here we are. We're in the process of moving from Passover, first fruits to Shavuot, or in other words, Holy Week, Good Friday, Resurrection Day, Pentecost, all wrapped, you know. Yeshua, of course, fulfills all the feasts of Israel, just like he fulfills all of Torah for all of the prophets and fulfills all of the scriptures. So since we're moving, and by the way, we're now in the time where we're counting days. Remember, we're counting the Omer from the first Sabbath after Passover, you count 49 days, following day is Pentecost, Shavuot. Shavuot means the Feast of Weeks because you count seven weeks. Next day is Pentecost. We say Pentecost because we use the Greek term for 50. So um, this year, the churches are celebrating Pentecost on Sunday, May 28th. And I think the feast on the Hebrew calendar, I think is the 26th. But anyway, it's going to be an awesome Pentecost weekend because we're going to spend it with Paul Wilbur and Marty Getz and Joshua Aaron from Israel. So it's going to be pretty awesome in beautiful Cleveland, Tennessee. Not Cleveland, Ohio, but Cleveland, Tennessee. Hey, where's Jordan? That's pretty funny. Anyway, but since we're moving toward this time of counting, today's day 29, by the way, so we're more than halfway. We only got to count to 49, so in 20 more days, we'll be done counting. And you, know, you have to remember, people in those days didn't have 18 calendars in their house and a calendar on their phone and a calendar on their computer. And, you know, I don't know how they kept track of what day it was and what time it was, but that's another story. So that's why God commands them to count days. He doesn't say, well, I'll count them if you feel like it. It's one of the laws. You have to count the Omer, you have to count the days. So since we're approaching that feast, which of course we know as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know, we've done teachings here and I'm sure we'll probably do another one in the next couple of weeks. And then Monica is going to do a couple as well, where in the Tanakh and the Old Testament, there's, I hate to use the word limited, but kind of limited outpourings of the Spirit. Holy Spirit falls on a prophet, and he prophesies, falls on a group of people, and they do something. You know, in the, in the book of Numbers and um, chapter 11, you know, that 70 elders get filled with the Spirit in the camp. They all prophesy, and then they never did it again. Well, when Pentecost, Shavuot, is fulfilled on that Sunday morning, when the Holy Spirit has poured out on 120 people in the upper room, 120 people who had been there for nine or 10 days, all united in prayer, 
nobody arguing, everybody in unison, everybody in agreement. The Holy Spirit falls that morning, and it's basically the beginning of evangelization. It's the birth of the church, that pathetic bunch of guys who's been walking around, and they've been hiding in the upper room for a long time. They go out and start to preach, and they don't waste any time. Peter doesn't put a talk together. He doesn't take time to make a PowerPoint. He doesn't go... He doesn't go up to the Temple Mount and say, I need to look at some scrolls before I can talk. He goes out and starts preaching because he's filled with the Spirit. So this is what we're, what we're pointing to. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, of course, is symbolized by water, by oil, and by fire. Water and oil are long time, you know, it, everyone in the Tanakh was anointed with olive oil that had perfumes in it. Christian churches have always anointed people with olive oil that has perfume in it. Use the Greek word prism, I don't know what the chrism, I don't know what the Hebrew word is. But this is how priests were anointed, the kings were anointed. People were anointed for special things that they had to do. The elements inside the temple were anointed. The pews, no, they didn't have pews. The chairs, no, they didn't have chairs. But everything was anointed with the oil. In fact, Mashiach, which we get the word Messiah, or Christos, that we get the word Christ, means the anointed one. There's an anointing. The anointing that the people used was with oil. It's a symbol of being sealed with the Holy Spirit. But it's also a symbol. Water is also a symbol because it's a cleansing. It's a, a cleaning out. It's Water's powerful. Water's always moving. And this is what we're going to start talking about tonight. And we're going to go to Ezekiel 47. If you have a Bible, I would suggest you turn to it because even though most of the scripture, what am I saying if you have a Bible? If you have a Bible with you, I should say. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of Bibles over there. Yeah. You can flip to it or click to it or however you however you do it. But um the, the scriptures are going to be up on the on the slides, but it's going to be kind of hard for everybody to read it, but that's okay. But Ezekiel 47, you know, this is, the, this is the river that goes out from the temple. People say, well, you know, nobody mentions the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, they do. Second verse of the whole scripture is the Spirit hovered over the abyss. The Ruach hovered over the abyss. God spoke with his breath, breath, which is the same word, ruach, which in Greek is pneuma, just like spirit is pneuma, because the same word means spirit, breath, and wind. Right? Yeshua says to Nicodemus, you feel what the wind does. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going, but you feel it moving. That's how the spirit moves. You don't see him. You don't know exactly where he's coming from or where he's going, but then you see his effects. And when the spirit moves, everyone is amazed. So there's so many places, but this is an example. We'll, we'll do some more probably next week. But there's so many samples, uh, examples in the Tanakh of God's spirit. I'm going to pour my spirit on so-and-so. I'm going to pour my spirit on David. I'm going to pour my spirit on the prophets. I'm going to pour my spirit on. And, you know, when you read John's gospel, chapter, his gospel 14, 15, 16, Yeshua talks about, it'll be the radio show this coming Sunday, <laughs> day after tomorrow, if you want to tune in. But it's going to be his, he promises the Spirit is coming, and he talks about the Holy Spirit as a person. It's not an it. It's not a cosmic force. It's not some. It says he is going to come. He is going to do. He is going to convict the world of sin. He is going to teach you all truth. He is going to remind you of everything I said. So the Holy Spirit is a distinct person as our all three persons that are in the Godhead. So since we cannot understand that, even when we're in heaven, we won't understand that. 
We're not going to go on with that. But we're going to go to the prophet Ezekiel because it's about water. It's about a river that runs from the temple. Where did it come from? We're going to see. Where does it go? We're going to see. What does it mean? We're going to see. Why would Ezekiel write about a river coming out of the sanctuary, going out into the wilderness and making everything live, going out into the barren land and have trees and flowers and fruit and animals start to grow, going into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea even comes alive. If you've been to Jerusalem and you look to the east, there is desert as far as you can see. All you can see is desert. And when you get on the highway, one that goes through there, it's a great ride. It's the lowest place on earth. I forgot how far below sea level it is. But it's the lowest place on earth is along that road. You don't see, once in a while you see somebody living in some little hut somewhere. Bedouin, yeah, actually there's even some little herds of sheep and goats. But there is nothing. This is the wilderness where Satan tempted Yeshua, is in this spot. Then it ends up at the at the Dead Sea, and as you look down on the Dead Sea, you go, whoa, that is weird looking. It's so dry and so hot and so... So this river is going to be involved with this, and it's going to change things. Now, is Ezekiel really talking about the actual desert and the actual sea? No, he's, he's talking about lives. He's talking about barren lives being changed. How many people have had the, their lives changed by Yeshua and the Holy Spirit? If you haven't, you see me afterwards. <laughs> Boy, this is a tough crowd, John. I don't know. So here we are. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000 and it was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that cannot be crossed. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, oh, sorry, came up twice. <laughs> but it's always good to repeat. <laughs> This is how we learn, right? By repetition. Sorry, the slide came twice. So what's happening here? There's a river that starts in the sanctuary. And it goes out the east side toward this wilderness. And there's a man who's measuring it. And it goes out a thousand cubits, it's up to his ankles. It goes out another thousand cubits, it's up to his knees. It goes out another thousand cubits, it's up to his waist goes another thousand cubits, you have to swim in it. You can't walk. The river is totally overwhelming him. He can't walk on it. So think about that. Starts little and goes bigger, 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 until finally Ezekiel's completely immersed in it. This is a vision, of course, not actually happening. Immersed. Somebody once made an incredible observation that if you go to a swimming pool, all the splashing around and the noise and the fun is in the shallow end. 
in the deep end are the people that really know how to be in the water. And they can't stand on the bottom, so they have to tread water, they have to swim. They are in, totally immersed in the water. And he used that as an as a image of what happens in the Holy Spirit. If you're just kind of involved, you know, you, it's kind of like walking on the beach and you get your toes wet and you say, oh, this is fun. Then you go out a little bit further and you say, oh, this is nice, but you're still in control. You go out a little bit further and it's up to your knees. Go out a little further, up to your waist, but you can still walk around. You're in control of where you're going. But when it's, the water is deeper than your height, you can't control it anymore. You can't walk on the bottom. You're not in charge of your movement anymore. The water moves you. So when you really get involved in Holy Spirit ministry, when you really get involved in the Pentecostal charismatic ministries of the church, you're totally immersed in the Spirit. Amen. And you go where the Spirit tells you to go, and you get rather than saying, "Well, I'll get my toes wet, but I don't want to go in too far because I want to still be in control." So. When I returned there, along the bank of the river were many, very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. This is the Dead Sea. When it enters the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. The river is bringing life. The river is bringing life to everywhere that it goes. Plant life, fish life, animal life, fruit trees we're going to see, trees that are for the heal, leaves that are for the healing of the nations. Everything is going to grow along this river, which just a little while ago, was just a horrible desert. Like, we've been to En Gedi, I don't know, a handful of times, seven or eight times, I don't know. And when, the, when, the, when you read in the books of Samuel how David hid out in En Gedi, I always look around there going, where in the world would he have hid out over here? It's just desolate. And then once in a while, there's a little green space, and there's a few trees, and then it's desolate again. There's a few trees that... I don't know where he was hiding, but he knew his way around, though. So this was also prophesied by Zechariah, my favorite minor prophet, who talks about living waters are going to flow out of Jerusalem. Flow, water flowing. Now, this is a desert climate, right? All of the Middle East pretty much is a desert climate. Water is incredibly important. I mean, you live in a climate like this, your life depends on water, much more so than ours does. You know, the woman at the well, you know, got to go every day. He says to her, you know, I'll give you a living water to drink. She goes, huh. Then ends up understanding and going and getting everyone. You know, he stands in the temple and says, if you're thirsty, come to me. You'll have living water inside of you. Living water. Hebrews referred to living water as any water that moved. You know, when you read the when you read through Torah, you see that things have to be purified, not just things, but people in moving water. You don't purify vessels by you know dipping them in a stagnant pond or a mud puddle or something, because that's not living water. It's movement. The water's moving. And they call it Maim Chaim, living water. And of course, it's a prefigurement of the Holy Spirit who's always moving, always moving, always moving with power. You know, a lot of people think the Holy Spirit stopped working at the end of the first century. And he left, and no one knows what happened to him after that. No, the Holy Spirit's always working. And when you encounter him, like I said, it's amazing. I mean, meeting Jesus is amazing. Having the Holy Spirit act on you is amazing. So living water, also in Revelation 22.1, a river comes out 
It's as pure as crystal. Pure, pure. Moving water is clean. Moving water is pure. Remember when you were a kid and you got, you took water out of a pond and you looked at it with your little microscope? There's all these little icky things swimming around in it, paramecia and amoebas and all this disgusting stuff. But if you take the water out of a moving river, the water's clean. And this is the point that the writer's getting at here. This is looking forward to the messianic time where there's going to be life and there's going to be grace and there's going to be joy because everything's going to be living. The water is going to be moving and bringing life because the Holy Spirit is going to be moving through the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is always moving through the church. Yeshua said when the, when the other paraclete comes, he's going to teach you all truth. And he says he's going to convict you of sin. And then he goes on to explain. He doesn't have a list of all the laws or even the list of the Ten Commandments and says, I convict you of this one, this one, this one, this one. It says what he convicts you of is that you didn't believe in me. The greatest sin is you don't know Jesus. And the Holy Spirit convicts you of that. So it's better you get convicted when you're living and you can do something about it than if you realize it after you've just taken your last breath. And then you realize, uh-oh, I missed the whole thing that I was created for. Uh-oh. So it's always moving. Yeshua's always talking about living water. And he says, living water is going to be inside of you. And you're never going to thirst. Because you're not going to go look for other kind of water. Right? If you've got living water inside of you, you're not going to say, well, I'm going to go over to that pond and take some water out of there. And maybe I'll drink some of that. you got living water inside of you. You know, the woman at the well thought he was talking about actual water. She's thinking physical water. He's talking about being filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Lives in us. You know, several times in the Scriptures it says, you know, even Solomon said, the heavens can't contain you, and I built this building for you to live in. How are you going to live in this building? Well, he did, but Solomon's point is, you're infinite. How are you going to live in this little building? You know, several times it says, in, it, it says in the scripture that he doesn't live in a temple made of stones anymore. He lives in us. We're living stones, Second Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're living stones. And we're built up into a house of prayer. We're built up to serve him because he lives in us. That's pretty cool. So when you go walking in the woods, you know, you got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You got Yeshua walking with you. You got the Father smiling on you saying, there's my son, there's my daughter. Look how, how, look how awesome they are. We're not really very awesome, are we? But this is the whole point. You're never going to be thirsty because you shouldn't be looking for anything else. The church today is looking for all kinds of other things. You know, let's have some great concerts on Sunday morning. We'll make the lights go, and we'll make the dry ice make the stuff, and, you know, the lights will strobe. I don't think they call them strobe lights anymore, but toot, 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 toot. And the mu we'll make the music louder and louder so people will say, whoa. Okay, that's good. There's a lot of good worship songs. But he's living in us. The water's moving within us. And... You see here in Ezekiel's vision, the water flows from a holy place. It doesn't start in the wilderness. It starts in the temple. It starts in the sanctuary. It starts at the altar. It starts at the place where God is worshipped. It starts in the place where God is present. It comes from God. He comes from God. It is the water, but he, the Holy Spirit, is what's symbolized by the water. And it starts in the holy place. 
the altar of sacrifice, and then goes out. You know, we know Isaiah chapter 2. The word always goes forth from Jerusalem. He doesn't say the word goes forth from Kansas City or the word word goes forth from Stockholm or the word it says the word always goes forth from Jerusalem. Yeshua had to die in Jerusalem. He's, it's his city. He had to rise in Jerusalem. It's his city. The Holy Spirit had to come down in that Pentecost outpouring in Jerusalem because everything has to start in Jerusalem and go out from there. Amen? Biblical. So the water goes forth out of the city and salvation, like we sang in that song, I know y'all in YouTube land didn't hear the song, Facebook land or wherever, but salvation comes from Jerusalem. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Salvation doesn't come from anywhere in Latin America, anywhere from in the Orient, anywhere in Scandinavia, anywhere in Antarctica. Salvation comes from Jerusalem. And why is that important? Look back to Torah. The sacrifices have to be done in the place where I put my name. In the wilderness, it's in the tent. When they get to the land, it's the tent for a while. Solomon builds the temple, and God says, this is where I put my name. The sacrifices have to be in Jerusalem. Yeshua's sacrifice had to be in Jerusalem. They couldn't have killed him in Nazareth. They couldn't have killed him in Capernaum or Tiberias. He had to die in Jerusalem because that's where the sacrifices were. So salvation comes and it goes out into dead areas. Dead areas. What do you mean dead? We're all alive. Man, you don't know what a cool life I have. I got a house. I got some cars. I got a great job. What do you mean dead? I'm not dead. Well, as a matter of fact, you are dead. Whether you're the rich guy from Beverly Hills or a rich guy from wherever, if you don't know Yeshua, you're a walking dead man. You're dead. You're a barren desert. You can't bear fruit. You can't be adopted. Romans 8, you can't be adopted as a son and, or daughter. And you can't call God Abba. You can't say, Daddy, here I am. Because you're living your own life. You're living your own independent life with your own money and your own cars and your own job and your own house. And hey, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. And I don't want any of you crazy people telling me any nonsense that people believed 2,000 years ago. Because I don't believe that. Well, you're up there. You're barren. You're dead. You're dead. And if you were to die that very moment, in about two seconds or less, you would realize just how dead you actually are. So the water, the water, the moving water goes out into dead areas. And it's going to go from Jerusalem into the whole world. And it's going to bring life everywhere that it goes. Because as the gospel message spread, life came all over the world. As people received the Holy Spirit, and whether you live in the Philippines, or whether you live in Sweden, or whether you live in Argentina, salvation is the same. The Holy Spirit is the same. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, male or female, whatever you are, it's the same. So it has to begin in Jerusalem, but it's going to flow into the whole world because the whole rest of the world is barren. Barren, barren, barren. And when you stand there, and I hope you get a chance to go sometime, but if you stand at the Mount of Olives and look east, you go, oh, how could anybody, even Yeshua himself, walked around in that desert? I mean, you get out of, you know, you're, you're, we're in a rental car that's air conditioned. You know, if you pull the car out on the side of the road and get out, it's like you get hit with a blast, 
a fire, you just go, oh, I got to get back in the car. You're not going to find shade trees. But that's what the world looks like. Oh, come on. I'm nice. I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. All the people that live on my street are real nice. They all go to work. Well, that's good. So also, you know, Yeshua said, I'm greater than the temple. One greater than the temple is here. One greater than Jonah is here. One greater than Solomon is here. You know, the one at the well says to him, huh, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? And he could have said, as a matter of fact, I am. If you'd like to see Jacob, I can bring him here and show him to you. Go over here. Jacob, come and say hello to the woman at the well. <laughs> but anyway, or like when they say, you're not even 50 years old and you know Abraham, he could have said, matter of fact, I do. I know him very well. I know him better than you do. And I could show him to you if I want to. No, he doesn't say that, but he could have said that. So, He's greater than the temple. So if this living water flows out of the temple in Ezekiel's vision, imagine how, because of what he does, what we commemorated over the last few weeks, imagine the Holy Spirit coming from him and from the Father into the world. Imagine how much more powerful that is compared to a river that came out of a temple. Am I the only one who thinks that's awesome? Whew, that's pretty awesome. So water flows from him. You know, when they pierced his side, blood and water came out. Now, medically, you can explain what was happening. You know, he had a pericardial effusion because of how hard his heart was working. But blood and water come out. He says, after the Son of Man is glorified, then the other paraclete is going to come. The Holy Spirit's not going to fall on everybody, you know, two years before the crucifixion. The Holy Spirit's not going to fall on everybody four days before the resurrection. It has to be after Yeshua's done with his work and he sits down. He sits down. He says, when I'm glorified, when I'm gone, you should be happy that I'm leaving. In John 15, I think it is. In John 15, you should be happy that I'm leaving because when I leave, the other paraclete's going to come and you're going to do greater things than I've done. Wait a minute. What do you mean greater things that you've done? How, how could that be possible? Well, you'll see. But he has to go first. He has to suffer first. He has to be glorified first. And then the Spirit comes. So... This river that starts that Ezekiel's talking about, it's a little bit, and it gets deeper, and then it gets deeper. No river was actually physically in this place, right? You can't find evidence that a river actually ran off the Temple Mount and into the desert. This is a vision that he's having. The river didn't actually exist he wasn't talking about something he saw there every day. This is a vision because it's foretelling, it's predicting what's going to happen after Messiah comes, that this living water is going to regenerate everything, including us. We've been regenerated. If you don't think you've been regenerated, come and talk to us afterwards. <laughs> In fact, Solomon had built, there's historical records that Solomon had built a reservoir by the temple just so they could have like a little supply of water there for, the, for their needs. But this is definitely a vision. This is the Holy Spirit flowing and moving, flowing and moving. Remember, wind and breath. The Holy Spirit never stands still.
if you've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, find a place where you can go and have it. <laughs> because you'll be totally changed. You'll get gifts. You'll look at things differently. You'll understand things differently. Can't even be, we can talk about that some other time. So as the river goes out, it gets deeper, just like the pool. All the people are splashing around in the shallow end. The people who really want to get involved are in the deep end. They want to really do the ministry. They want to really be immersed, literally, in the spirit. You know, why do you think baptism involves water? Oh, yeah, sure, it's from Nick Fun stuff. But it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit acting on you. Woo, it's awesome. And it gets deeper as it goes. It starts underground. And when you look at it from our point of view, it begins even inside of us. We have living water inside of us that then goes out to other people that we affect. Right? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you affect other people. You don't say, ha ha, I got Holy Spirit. Just like, you know, you don't want to be an evangelist. So, oh yeah, I know Jesus. I know he's, yeah, I, I know he's, but I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to. No, you can tell everybody. Look at it in the scripture. Everybody who encounters Jesus goes and tells everybody about it. The Holy Spirit goes into you and through you and out so you can influence people around you like this river. And it gets deeper as it goes. You know, in, in um, Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, we're hidden with Christ. We're in him. You know, we have the living water because of what he did. We're filled with, filled with the spirit because of what he did. We're living in him. So after he's glorified, the Ruach, the spirit, is poured out and fills us. Just like that river going out. So there's power and there's gifts that accompany him. You may get the gift of tongues. You might get the gift of evangelization. You might get the gift of music. You might get the gift. We don't know. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12. You can read that for your homework. One spirit, but many gifts. And not everybody gets the same gifts. If everybody got the same gifts, that wouldn't be good. Because then the church, the body of Messiah, couldn't function if everybody had the same gift. And he uses the parts of the body as an example. You can't just have an you can't just have eyes. You can't just have ears. You can't just have noses. You have to have feet. You have to have arms. You have to have eyes. You have to have ears. You have to have a heart. You have to have a liver. You have to have kidneys. And all the parts of the body work together to keep the body alive. And in Ephesians, he, in, in Ephesians, I can't remember if it's five or five, he, five, he says the, the gifts are for the building up of the body. They're not for your personal enjoyment. Or you don't walk around saying, I got gifts. I don't know about you. I got gifts. <laughs> Look at that guy over there. He's got nothing. I got gifts. Yeah. Yep, Holy Spirit gave me this. Yep, yep. <laughs> no, it's for the building up of the body. You know, if you had the gift of teaching, and every day you made a teaching, and you never gave it anywhere, it'd be great for you, but it doesn't help the body. If you have the gift of music, and you sit in your family room all day playing worship songs, that's nice. It's nice for you. But if no one else ever hears it, that's not the point. That's The point is everybody has to hear it. And so the gifts are for the building up of the body. And of course, it's running water. The gospel's always moving forward. The spirit's always moving. The gospel's been moving forward for 2,000 years. Can you imagine? And even if you take the whole rest of the scriptures, you know, I always use the example of Abraham. <clears throat> you know, we can call him Father Abraham because he's our spiritual father. Since Alan is in here tonight, you know, he's Alan's real father. He's our spiritual father. 
But we look back, say Abraham was, I don't know, 4,000 years ago or so. And here we are, 4,000 years later, and we know who Abraham was, is. I mean, we're going to meet Abraham in heaven someday. And we're going to say, wow, you're Abraham? That's awesome. Give me five. I always say you were an old man living in present-day Iraq. <laughs> He's going to say, I wish you hadn't said that all the time. Oh, come on, that was funny. <clears throat> so it's running water. The gospel's always moving. The gospel's active. So for 2,000 years, people have been getting saved by the gospel moving through the world, right? Because God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children, right? Doesn't matter how holy your family is, if you don't know Jesus, right? I mean, your father could be a pastor or Eastern Orthodox priest, and his father could have been a pastor, and his father could have been a pastor, and his father could have been a pastor. But here you are in 2023, and you say, yeah, I don't believe any of that stuff. All those guys being in ministry doesn't help you out at all because you got to come. You got to come to the cross. You got to come to salvation. So it's an active principle. You don't get saved passively. Well, I'll just sit here and maybe something good will happen. You know, you ever, you ever evangelize somebody, you're witnessing to somebody, and you say, you know, Jesus is going to judge you. You might die today. Judge. And they'll say, well, you know, I just kind of hope for the best. I say, no, it doesn't work that way. You can hope for the best, and he'll be merciful, but if you don't know him. So an active principle, and it goes deeper and more full as it goes. And it's always growing. And it's always showing us the depths of God, the depths of the gospel, the depths of Yeshua, of the Spirit, the Father. We can never learn it all, right? I like toward the end of Acts, with uh, might be chapter 25 or 26, where Paul's talking to this um, I can't remember if it's the Roman guy or King Agrippa. King Agrippa, I think. And King Agrippa says, so much learning has made you mad. Like, you've learned so much stuff, you're crazy now. <laughs> you can never learn all of it. When we're in heaven, we won't understand the Trinity in its fullness because we can't comprehend that. So we search for the depths and if we immerse ourselves in the water, we're going to see more and more of the depths. Depths is a hard word for me to say. Depths. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the Spirit searches the depths of God. Can you imagine? God is so complex and so overwhelming that he's the only one who can understand himself. Nobody else can, angels can't understand them. We can't understand. But the Spirit searches the depths of God. So the deeper we get, the more we learn. And it's kind of like the history of the church. You start in biblical times. There's patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The 12 boys. You know, go into David, let's say. You have the giving of the law to Moses. So now you've gone from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fast forward to now we have a covenant. So we've gone deeper. The only they were the only people that had a covenant with God. Then there was revelation from the prophets. So they learned more about God as time went on. The writer to the Hebrews says in the first chapter, God revealed himself to the prophets a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. But now he speaks to us through his son, who is the ultimate messenger. Read Hebrews chapter 1 for your homework too. So Messiah Yeshua slash the gospel is the ultimate in the history. This is what everything pointed to. That's why in chapter 2 of Hebrews, the writer says, 
Don't neglect such a great salvation. Don't turn away from it. Don't say, eh, I don't believe any of that. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, come on. Because then he says, what do you have left? If you reject the gospel, what do you have left? Well, you can try to follow the law. Good luck with that. Or you can hope for the best. Good luck with that. So don't neglect this great salvation. The river got deeper as time went on. Yes, yes. So it also applies to how a believer grows, right? Like Song of Songs applies to the believer, applies to the church. It applies to the believer. You mature, you get more knowledge, you change your lifestyle, you start to evangelize others. You start to understand, you know, my life before this was actually pretty empty. My life before this, I thought I was happy, but man, I didn't understand what I was even doing. Oh, yeah, you know, when I was a kid, people taught me about God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wow, I didn't know anything because the rivers flowed out and now you're in the deep end. And if you're not in the deep end, keep going down the river. <laughs> so this water, like the Holy Spirit, brings life into a barren place. That desert is dead. The Dead Sea is dead. But every place where the water goes, fruits produce, life forms. And as we get deeper into that river, we produce more fruit. What happens if you don't pr produce fruit? The tree's cut down and thrown in the fire. Oh, wait a minute, but I'm a good person. I went to church 50 times last year. Oh, great. Have you produced any fruit? Well, I don't know, what do you mean? Chop, chop, chop into the fire. 21st, Christ, 21st century Christianity, hey, I got it made. I got the music team. I got high five Jesus on Sunday morning. I don't know anything, but hey, this is all cool. I'm good. We're all good. But fruit is produced. And as Yeshua said in John chapter 10, I came to give you life. You don't have life without him. I don't care how many rabbis you follow. I don't care how many priests you hang around with. I don't care how many pastors you hang around with. If you don't know Yeshua, you don't have life. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> and he says, I give you life abundantly. Abundantly. Not just, oh, I'm kind of getting by. Yeah, my spiritual life, you know, eh, kind of getting by. Last week, you know, I said two prayers, and I read a verse of scripture last month, but I can't remember what it was. No, you have life abundantly, but look at verse 10. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from Engedi to Eglaim. They will be in places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. There's gonna be so much life in this river that you're going to fish and you're going to get stuff every time you fish. You're going to get knowledge. You're going to get blessing. You're going to get gifts every time you throw the nets in. But, oh, don't you hate when there's a but? But, there's an old saying when the scripture says, therefore, you always have to ask, you always have to ask, what is it therefore? When the scripture says, but, it means, uh oh. Is there a catch to this? <laughs> but its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They'll bear fruit every month because of the water that flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. So if you're in the river, if you're by the river, you get blessing, you get gifts, you got food, you got the leaves don't wither. Your faith doesn't wither. It only grows. But 
if you're in the swamp and the marshes, you won't be healed. These are kind of on the side of the river. You know, you have a little swamp, a little marsh. So the river's going over here, and there's some water over there, and you think, I think I'm just going to hang out over there. All this moving water, I think it's kind of silly. It scares me a little bit, but I think it's kind of silly. So I'm just going to go over there where the water doesn't move. That's going to be given over to salt. When the Romans conquered Carthage after the last Punic War, they destroyed the whole city and they sowed salt into the ground so nothing would ever grow there again. When they destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, they plowed the Temple Mount under and put salt in it so that nothing would ever grow there. So if you're not in the river, you're going to be given over to salt. You're not going to grow. Your face not going to increase. You're not going to produce fruit. So the dead, so people dead in trespasses are made are made alive because of the river. Children of wrath become children of love. We become adopted sons and daughters. Romans eight and Galatians uh, four. Well, anyway, we call God Abba. We're adopted into the family. We were dead, but now we're alive. We were sickening slaves to sin, but now we're adopted children. <clears throat> but those that are settled in their own sinfulness aren't going to be healed. I don't care what you tell me. That's nonsense. I'm not changing my life. I'm happy the way I am. Nobody's ever come back to tell us. You have any proof of that? Any proof of what you say? Huh, I don't believe it. Salt. You're given over to salt. So everybody else is catching the fish. The leaves aren't withering. Fruits coming. Medicines coming out of the leaves. But you're sitting in this salty thing, not being changed, not being saved, not being purified. Barren. So they got fruit, they got healing. And this, of course, is also in, um, oops, well, wherever it went, Revelation. There it is, Revelation 22, 2. A crystal river, and it's all alive. So this is a prefigurement. All of this is a prefigurement of the Holy Spirit. It's a prefigurement for what's going to happen at Pentecost, Shavuot, where the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out in an unlimited measure, not just on a prophet here and there, not on 70 elders, but even somebody who's sitting in the back of this room praying, Holy Spirit works on him. Somebody goes out to Brook Park Road and says, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Holy Spirit falls on him. Woo. So we'll do some more examples from, from the Tanakh before we actually get to Pentecost. And Pastor Monica is going to have a couple of, of awesome gifts of the spirit teachings as well. So I know this went way too long. So let's, let's close with the blessing. And then if you have any questions or comments, that would be great. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace is true shalom that the world could not give, but that you give abundantly because you are the sar shalom, you're the prince of peace. We ask all these things in your name and we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would continue to work in more powerful ways in our lives, in a world that's become more and more barren and more and more desert and more and more sand. We ask that you would pour your spirit out that all these barren areas would come to life and would come to you and salvation in the gospel. We pray in your name. 
Amen.